Borderline personality disorder comes with many misconceptions. Here to talk about some of the most common, Dr. Romani. Well, let's just start with the name. Borderline personality. <laughs> what yes. does that even mean, right? What does that? It's old. It goes way back early in the psychoanalytic tradition where there was a theoretician that viewed borderline personality as being on the border between psychosis and neurosis. The, the sadness and the inability to regulate their emotions, that being the neurotic part, and the psychotic part being that, that getting paranoid and delusional mm -hmm. and sometimes even dissociative under times of stress. You were seeing a little bit of each pattern. They failed to get all of the instability and all those other patterns, but the name stuck. So people often say on the borderline of what? What and would you so call it? I would, I would call it um, uh, chronic affective instability disorder. Chronic affective, affective instability. And what does affective mean? Affective is a word we use for emotion. Affect means emotion, mood. Okay. So the, in fact, the disorders like depression, bipolar disorder fall under a rubric called affective disorder. So affect is emotion. Yeah. And so affective instability or lability, if you will, that's when you have very unstable moods. And that's what I would call it because that's the core. That, that's the core. Just you giving me that name. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking for hours mm -hmm. shooting videos yeah. today. Just you giving me that yeah. name brought a whole new sense of understanding yeah. to borderline personality disorder. And I, that's why I don't like the name. I think we should call it emotional instability disorder because that's really what it gets at. When yes. you call it borderline personality, it feels like a mystery. And then anytime it's a mystery, it adds to the stigma. already existing stigma yes. we have about mental illness. And that's why we're doing all problem. of this. Yeah. There, there are people who go watch these videos, go mm -hmm. to medcircle.com, get on the free yeah. digest of whatever topic they're interested, borderline personality mm -hmm. disorder, bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and they immediately realize that the stigma yeah. was so great yeah. and the truth and reality yeah. behind whatever yeah. they're looking for yeah. was actually uh, not as yes. bad or not as mysterious right. as they thought. That's yeah. right. So yeah. that number one, the name raises some misconceptions. Yes. It's really, it's, it's a disorder of instability, instability of everything, okay? Mm -hmm. Number two is that it often get, another misconception is it often gets confused with bipolar disorder. Yep. And, and it's this idea that, oh, her moods are all over the place, she's bipolar. As soon as I hear her moods are all over the place, I'll say, slow down, sister. Step back and tell me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And the story they start to tell me is much more consistent with borderline personality. That's probably the biggest misconception about it. The other misconception is even this borderline word, sometimes to some people does mean a split personality, especially since we do talk about splitting in the disorder. Mm -hmm. So people will confuse it with what we call dissociative identity disorder right. or multiple personality disorder as it's commonly termed. It's not that either. So there's all these things it gets mislabeled at. And since borderline personality can look different in different clients, it gets confused there. Another misconception is men cannot get borderline personality disorder because there, there's is, a way there's a misconception that men cannot or, or very rarely very rarely get or, or get diagnosed with it if and anything I from what I've learned today I would almost feel like men would be more prone well what ends up happening is they do get misdiagnosed they get sometimes thrown more in the impulse of in, in they get more thrown into the impulse control disorders so men are might men might be more likely to have what we call sort of anger management issues. Yes. Instead of calling it straight up borderline personality, we would label it sort of as its impulse control disorder friend. Men are much more likely, for example, though, to be diagnosed with narcissistic traits or narcissistic personality. Men often, though, too, at a young age, are often required to sort of bring in that emotional world. Yep. They're just told to shut it down, mm -hmm. don't have those emotions. And if they carry on that childhood teaching, they might actually become quite the opposite. They become very emotionally restrictive, which is again, a different kind of a pattern. So it could also be how girls and women are socialized to express emotion. Because to the degree that borderline personality would link back to traumas like sexual trauma. Many boys are sexually traumatized mm -hmm. and so and, and experience sexual abuse as boys. In fact, they're sometimes less likely to talk about it, get help for it. They, they express more shame in the face of it. If a boy is raped, he's much likely to ever come out about it than a woman who was raped. You know, much, so much, much more likely. A, a boy, I'm sorry, a young man or a boy is much less likely, less likely to come out about being sexually assaulted than a woman might be willing to. And both right. groups are not often that likely to. Right. So 
what combination of stars here, it also is how we diagnose. A clinician who sees a man, it's almost like their borderline personality disorder radar drops. Well, this person's not going to have borderline personality disorder, it's a man, and they're less likely to do so. That's why it's so important that clinicians just get their data, and good ones do, and then make the diagnosis on the basis of the symptomatology and not on the basis of bias. Yeah. And that's, that's in a huge area in psychological and psychiatric research is how race, ethnicity, social class, sexual orientation, and gender can all come into how we sort of push our diagnostic labels. And we have to be very mindful of that. Is there hope for people who suffer from borderline personality disorder? I want there to be hope for people who experience any mental illness, mm -hmm. personality disorders inclusive. So I'm gonna say there is hope, but it's hope with caution. This is an incredibly, incredibly complex disorder to manage clinically, and it requires really intensive clinical management, especially in the initial phases. Dialectical behavioral therapy, which has been shown in the research to work, is an intensive model of therapy. It requires individual therapy, group therapy, right. daily check-ins. Initially, the gold standard would be in somebody with borderline personality disorder that they either have a, what we call a partial hospitalization program, meaning they come home at the end of the day, they sleep at home at night, but they're in a sort of hospitalization intensive setting all day, or what we call intensive outpatient treatment where they're in an outpatient center all day. That's often an important place. It's almost like a full-time job to learn how to manage these symptoms for several weeks and then go to more of a classical dialectical behavioral therapy outpatient model on the outside. But I'm gonna be frank with you, the realist in me is gonna say, most people can't afford that. Yeah. So there's a lot of people out there with under or untreated borderline personality disorder. So is there hope? Yes, but the intensiveness and the consistency in therapy that's often needed is pretty significant. And if people can get that and can get in and out of the treatment that they need, it's quite possible you can see some improvement, particularly in managing emotions. Well, and, and you know what? It might be expensive and a, and a yeah. lot of work, but mm -hmm. at least there is a treatment yeah, plan in yeah. place. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of other yeah. diagnoses, mental health or, or mm -hmm. otherwise, that there are no options. Right. You know, you, you get a diagnosis from a doctor and they don't have the options right. for you. There is an option here. There is an option, Yes. but it requires engagement and treatment. And one of the hardest things with all personality disorders, and borderline personality disorders, no exception, right. is the willingness to enter treatment. Yes, that's huge. There's yeah. a lot of people out there with borderline personality disorders like you saying, said, I don't have a problem, this you, isn't my problem, you're you out to get me. You have worked with a lot of people yeah. with borderline personality mm -hmm. disorder and saw success when mm -hmm. they were motivated. They're motivated yes. and the therapist was supported. This right. is not for the faint of heart. And for a clinician who's working with clients with borderline personality disorder, that clinician needs to be supported, which is why it's really important they're working as part of a team. As somebody who's soloed on some of this work, it, it can get exhausting. You feel invalidated. Remember, narcissistic personality, borderline personality, these are disorders of insecurity. People mm. who are insecure always spread their insecurity onto other people. Whether they're doing it intentionally or not doesn't matter. That's what they do. So it, as you leave that room, you often feel more insecure than when you walked in. Mm. And that can be draining for a clinician, for other people close to this person. And that person with borderline personality often walks through the world slowly believing that nobody wants to spend time mm -hmm. with them because that's the feedback that they're getting from the right. world. Well, no question, this is a complex issue. I recommend if you've watched this video and have not watched uh, the nine traits of borderline personality disorder that you go ahead and watch that next. It's fascinating and sheds some more light into this complex disorder. And then from there, make sure you go to medcircle.com and sign up for that free digest. Dr. Romani, you're the best. Thanks Thank for being you, here. Kyle. Thanks for watching. Your next step is to head on over to medcircle.com and sign up for the Med Circle Digest. What is it? Well, Med Circle will send you the latest articles and the latest videos on the mental health topics that matter most to you. So go to medcircle.com, sign up for that digest, and let's keep this journey on better mental health moving forward.